I want to introduce to you a very special friend of mine, Dr. Margaret Bruchak. She is an Abenaki woman and she is an anthropologist and she is a professor and she is a museum consultant and she's a historian and she's a researcher. She's, oh my gosh, she's a performer. She performs Abenaki music, song and dance. Um, she's an amazing, incredible mind, and we're so happy that um, she's with the Repatriation Conference um, today. She is the author of the book Savage Kin, Indigenous Informants and American Anthropologist. That's an award-winning book, and I hope you all will look that up and get that. Um, I know Marge from back in 2009, 2009. Um, when we uh, found that there were two wampum belts for sale at Sotheby's. I was working as an attorney with the Onondaga Nation and the other traditional nations of the Haudenosaunee. And uh, one of those belts uh, was a Mohawk belt and the other belt was an Abenaki belt. And by hook and by crook and this way and that, we were able to find Marge, who was an incredible researcher that helped us locate the stories of these belts and how they came into the possess possession of the George Gustav High Museum and how they were removed from that possession. Uh, of that institution, but still remained on the um, uh, accession records of the National Museum of the American Indian uh, long after it had left that place. So I'm hoping that Marge is going to tell you a little bit of that story um, and, and some more wonderful work that she's doing in repatriation area. area. And um, I'm gonna uh, pass this along to Marge. Thank you for joining us, Marge. The the stage is yours. Katsilioni, thank you, Shannon. It's wonderful to be here. I speak to you from Nanatuck Homelands in the Quinnetacook River Valley of Western Massachusetts, and much of my work is done at the University of Pennsylvania, which is the Lanapa Hoking Homelands. So all of this work is dedicated to all of these indigenous peoples who are looking to not only recover significant objects from museums, but also find ways to restore their understanding of themselves. And Shannon, is the full screen coming through? Looks like we're here. Yes, you're all good, Marge. Thank Great, you. thank you. So today, what I have to share with you is a talk about the gaps in what I call restorative research, and to share with you some particular case histories in heritage search and recovery, because I find that despite the advent of repatriation legislation and truth and reconciliation commissions, many museums in North America are still entangled in disputes over the ownership of indigenous collections, and not just North America, Europe and around the world as well. Now, in principle, curators and claimants should be eager to engage in thoughtful discussion around cultural objects, embodied meanings, ancestral knowledges. And yet I find that discussion around repatriation often focuses on verifiable answers to questions that are shaped by museological protocols and bureaucratic practices rather than by indigenous nations. And so today I will share insights from several restorative research projects that bring us closer to the ethics of reconciliation by recognizing indigenous claims. But first, let me walk back to the case that Shannon introduced you to, to talk about a successful repatriation case that began with an advertisement from Sotheby's auction house. In the spring of 2009, two historical belts identified as early and rare, once having been part of the Museum of the American Indian Collections, were advertised for sale. One was identified as having been collected by Frank Speck from the Mohawk Nation of Ganesatage. The other was identified as Abenaki, and it too was tagged with an old MA, MAI number. And so the first question was, how did these leave the museum? 
Now, the Sotheby's notice caught the attention of the Haudenosaunee Standing Committee on Burial Rules and Regulations, a consortium of Six Nations peoples, including tribal historians and community leaders who serve as advocates and watchdogs. They contacted me, and based on the provenance information provided by Sotheby's, they were certain that these belts were tribal property, but Sotheby's insisted that they were private property rather than tribal property, or that they were valuable art objects rather than sacred objects, or that they were simply relics with no history to be found or to connect them to any. And of course, that those are the kinds of assertions that really helped me get to work to do something about it. Now, the research to untangle the origins of these belts and their journeys eventually brought back together not just that Mohawk belt and an Abenaki belt, but it also called back another Mohawk belt. And as you see in the image on the left here, here's a photograph taken by Frank Speck in 1915 of the two wampum belts he purchased from a Frenchman who surreptitiously got them Gnesetage. On the right, you see the same two belts in 2018 after they had been returned and brought together. So the research not only returned the two belts from Sotheby's, but brought home another belt as well. And when they came home, it was a restoration that healed a century old rift, but it's a long and complicated story. And yet it's not unique. Thousands of other sacred and patrimonial objects are still circulating on the art market and in private hands, and it can be difficult to call them back. So as a result of the Sotheby's research, I put together this list that I call tactics of strategic alienation, because I realized that in many, many cases, objects were knowingly removed from tribal custody, and then they were represented as relics that somehow represented dead or dying nations. So that gives you the impression there's no one they belong to. And then when they became museum objects, then they were tangible heritage belonging to museums, again, asserting colonial ownership rather than tribal ownership. Sometimes wampum belts and obviously many, many other objects were concealed or transported like treasures. And they were sometimes taken across borders and sometimes locked in trunks and sometimes just lost to, to view. But whenever they were publicly displayed, there was another shift in meaning because public displays tended to emphasize their value and their unknowability as though somehow as decorative objects, they could never be identified. And of course, that leads to their exoticization as well. So these are just some of the tactics that were used. And so today, in talking to you, what I'm going to do is share with you some insights into cases that worked around these tactics. And here I owe a great debt to my dear friend, Rick Hill, because when the Sotheby's case came up, that also led to a long and lifelong collaboration with Rick Hill, who had been working on this for decades as part of the Standing Committee, and also in his position at the Deo Hage Indigenous Knowledge Center. And my two research assistants, Lise Puyo on the left and Stephanie Mock in the center, have also been instrumental to what I call the Wampum Trail Project. But today, I'm not talking about the Wampum Trail, I'm talking about other case histories. So let me launch into that discussion. Now, during the early years of salvage anthropology, as is probably not news to any of you, collecting practices routinely separated objects from their communities, from their stories, from their origins. And in the absence of consultation with indigenous knowledge bearers, objects were sorted by type, by collector, by geographical region or culture area, and they were obscured and labeled in ways that still cause confusion in collections today. And here I am at the Yale Peabody Harvard Museum looking at some wampum belts that are surprisingly well documented and yet cataloged as basically unknown. And I should note there's a wampum collar on the table as well and a number of other belts we were examining. So my point here is that what's happened is that multiple worlds of meaning have been operating simultaneously. In the indigenous world, human remains are ancestors and objects are not just belongings, but beings some with potential animacy that can facilitate or enact human relations. But in the museum world, human remains were collected as inert biological specimens and objects were, and often still are, treated as inherently inanimate things. As a result, many indigenous materials are orphaned and decontextualized. And so I asked to whom do these object beings belong? How did they get here? <laughs> 
and how do we bring them home? Now, the process of reconceptualizing object relations requires more than just mere provenance research. Because what I find is that often the museum may have the documentation, but it is housed separately from the objects, or the objects may live in one museum and the documentation may live somewhere else altogether. And it's not routine for museums or for curators to pull these details together. And so when museums are considering repatriation claims vis-a-vis -vis NAGPRA protocols, their work typically begins with questions that address NAGPRA rather than indigenous needs. So let me make this clear. Under NAGPRA, museums need to know what data is recorded, who are the experts, does the material fit a predetermined definition, how valuable is the item to the museum, how important are the remains for study, can indigenous oral traditions be trusted, is this particular tribal nation the most appropriate claimants, who has the authority to decide? Ironically, under NAGPRA, the museum makes the final determination. And so in this case, you're looking at objects that were at the Yale Peabody Museum of Natural History. When I examined them in 2014, they were subject to an open repatriation claim that had not yet been settled. So the process of reconceptualizing, as I know, requires more than merely research. These different meanings have different end games and so much of my work deploys what I call reverse fieldwork or reverse ethnography. I track the collectors, sometimes literally retracing their steps to recover, rec recover crucial data. And this is by no means a complete list, but by reevaluating the origins of anthropological knowledge, we can understand how certain individuals came to be experts on particular objects or categories or tribal nations. By re-examining ethnographic representations, we can understand where many of the stereotypes emerge from and why they persist and why they are still carried on in different ways. By really carefully reconsidering collections, categories, and correspondence, we may find that seemingly unknowable objects are actually well-documented, but just in disparate locales. And so, as I said earlier, I also track the collectors. So, there are many, many ways to apply these tactics to case histories, but the key thing is to reconceptualize indigenous knowledges as central, not tangential, not just another form of information that the museum can acquire and use and catalog for its own purposes, but really essential to understanding where objects come from, how they are used, how they are meant to be used, and really where they belong. And that includes reclaiming and what I call re-indigenizing archeological sites. And I'll say a little more about this as we go along. So indigenous objects in museums often reflect the influence of the processes that separated them from their sources more than the processes that created them. Objects and documents housed in one museum might shed light on poorly identified objects in another museum. And here I am with Laura Pears at the Pitt Rivers Museum as part of a very detailed search for lost wampum belts belonging to the Wampanoag and to other nations. And that is a long story in itself. There's so much to say about wampum. I could spend the whole time talking about wampum. But I really like to make the point that crucial contextual information can always be recovered by interrogating curators and by consulting with indigenous experts. And I use those two different words quite consciously. So for instance, here my assistant Liz Puyo is revisiting records of a Vatican wampum belt at Kitigan Zibi, the community that created the belt in the early 1800s to send to the Vatican, the community that is separated from that object, object today, and the community that can still translate the documents that once accompanied that object. So sometimes we are sort of restoring cohesion to long lost conversations that we're picking up again to understand how they might illuminate where objects have gone and where they belong. Because wherever possible, I seek to construct what can best be called object cartographies, maps that can be followed forward or backward in time to trace an object's travels. This includes methodically investigating each step of an object's life history as it made its way into the museum. 
And during encounters and collections, I often find that we are, in a sense, picking up conversations that left off a century or more ago. By talking about, around, and with these objects, we can learn a great deal more than the scanty data on the collection card. And while encouraging curators to think more holistically about their personal and professional relations with the collections, we also hope to forge new ways of relating in the present. We recognize that multiple, sometimes conflicting interpretations can coexist, but they can often be resolved by talking with one another. And here we are meeting with George Hamill at the Rochester Museum and Rock Foundation around a collection of wampum pieces that came out of Seneca sites that have since been returned to Canandagon. And that is a case where there is an ongoing relationship now with George Hamill and with the curators at Canandagon. So here I think we could learn from some of the curatorial guidelines established by the first archivist circle in 2007. And these include, these are specifically designed for documents, but they really apply to objects, to knowledges, to a number of different categories as well. Because if we recognize that the conditions under which Native American knowledges can be ethically and legally acquired and access change through time, that can tell us why something that seemed appropriate a century ago is by no means appropriate today. That the assertions that many collectors and museums made over ownership are really false and really need to be undone. But again, that work has to happen through consultation. And I also do some work consulting with different archives. And so for example, at places like the American Philosophical Society, They've been working with a number of different tribal nations to establish appropriate protocols around culturally sensitive documents and images in their collection, things that should not be seen outside of the community. And that's something that is still evolving as we go along, where researchers are increasingly learning how to respect a community's request to restrict access, how to ensure that any restrictions are actually observed and to refrain from performing specialized care. And this is especially true with objects that may in the past have been treated with poisons, with things that may have been mishandled, to really understand what is appropriate, again, from an indigenous context outward, rather than from a museum context inward. Now, NAGPRA theoretically was designed to help recover objects and help identify objects that needed to be returned. But what I find is that the guidelines in NAGPRA, as helpful as they seem, are aspirational rather than routine in practice, because they do not strictly align with tribal understandings. And as I said early on, museums are allowed to make these determinations through consultation in whatever way they choose. So museums actually are free under NAGPRA to reject or resist or disagree with what they learn from their tribal consultants and come to their own conclusions based on the documentation they hold or the documentation they choose to use. So for example, cultural patrimony is defined as objects having ongoing historical, traditional, or cultural importance central to the tribe rather than property owned by an individual tribal or organization member. So there actually are a number of cases where objects and museums were purchased from a single individual who asserted ownership, whether or not that individual had the right within their tribal nation to own that object. And so purchase is not de facto proof of the rights of a museum or of the refusal of repatriation. And you'll notice interestingly enough under NAGPRA, the Confederacy of Wampum Belts of the Iroquois, the Haudenosaunee, are an iconic case of an object of cultural patrimony, which is why it strikes me as so ironically interesting that so many museums say that wampum belts are unknowable and are not necessarily patrimonial. But it says so in NAGPRA. But my point is this, that NAGPRA is not as straightforward as it should be and not as inclusive as it could be. Because although the NAGPRA protocols appear to value multiple forms of evidence to reach these determinations, in practice, museum curators and trustees retain the power to reach conclusions that more often than not 
privileged scholarly assessments over indigenous assessments. And so I sometimes suggest that the legislation has not actually restored respect for indigenous ownership, it has legislated respect for particular protected categories of objects that are accepted by museums as protected. You follow me here is that there is protection and then there is museum protection and they are not necessarily the same. So as a case in point, consider the example of the Mohegan request to the Penn Museum to repatriate the mask shown in this 2003 article. And here I have permission from the Mohegan Nation to show this image. So in 1996, the Mohegan tribe made its claim, but the Penn Museum rejected the claim based on two assertions. One assertion is that the museum enjoys a special relationship to the Mohegan people through Frank Speck who grew up on the reservation. The second assertion was that this does not meet the legal NAGPRA definition of sacred object. And the compromise that the museum came up with was to offer the mask on a long-term loan. The problem is the two assertions the museum put forward are both patently false. So Frank Speck did not grow up on the reservation. That was a common myth that was widely spread after his death. And the second is that sacred object is not in the control of the museum to determine, but in the control of tribal experts from that particular nation to determine. And so even though this object is now back in the official custody of the Mohegan Nation, it does not stand as a representative case of a collaborative resolution, but rather of an awkward and delayed resolution to a valued claim. And so my question is, has NAGPRA actually helped? Have legal approaches complicated the process? Does it rest too heavily on embedded precepts of American property law? Why does institutional compliance vary so widely? Why do museums still retain control? And when are loans and co-curation appropriate? I know of a number of cases where museums have offered loans or co-curation over objects that are still being under contention or claims that are not yet resolved, but I'm not sure that that's actually the right strategy. It could be in some cases, but I don't think it is in all cases. And so I suggest restorative strategies that devise new models of reporting that reward cooperation. At present under NAGPRA, museums are not obliged to speak with one another. They are not obliged to locate all of the information that exists about an object. That is something that often external consultants like myself do by moving between and among different institutions. And we need to insist upon recognition of tribal authority and heritage ownership and require more comprehensive archival research. When I say research, I do not mean invasive research. I do not mean to encourage holding on to collections while more research is done for whatever purpose, but research that restores an understanding of what was and what is and what should be with regards specifically to sacred and patrimonial objects. And so if we envision new models of protection and heritage recovery, there are cases where a museum is the appropriate repository and a tribal nation might ask a museum to hold on to something if it doesn't have an appropriate place to keep it. But honestly, if a tribal nation asks for something to be returned, I really don't think it's up to the museum to reject that request. But again, that's a problem. NAGPRA should be facilitating more returns but often it becomes a sort of stopgap measure that slows things down. And in part, this is because there is not enough cooperation among institutions and native nations. And so as a researcher, what I try to do, as I say, is to really go into these institutions to understand what the curatorial concerns are. And here I am with my dear friend, Stephen Loring at the National Museum of Natural History looking at wampum belts that still require more documentation and more consultation. Because if we carefully investigate the origins of museum stories about objects, we may find that there are other ways to repair the damage and that we do not just have to rely on NAGPRA, but there may be other solutions. And so with that in mind, the core of what I'd like to share with you today is a series of case histories of recent rep repatriations that for various reasons were successfully created and completed outside of NAGPRA 
in some cases, despite rejections through NAGPRA. So case study number one is archeological material from Fort Shantuck. Now, the reason I share this story for starters is that technically archeological collections are not in a NAGPRA category of their own. If they are associated with a burial, they are funerary objects, either associated or unassociated, depending on whether the burial is collected with them, but they are not by definition considered patrimonial or sacred without further documentation. And so countless museums have large collections, whether it be materials from shell mittens, materials from archeological home sites that are not considered NAGPRA sensitive, but in many cases there are tribal nations who would very much like to see these objects come home. And Shantok is a great example. So during the early 20th century, this particular Mohegan site in present day Uncasville, Connecticut was uncovered by both amateur and professional archeologists. Given the interest in military warfare, many of the excavations focused on seeking evidence of weapons and fortifications. Shantok materials were dispersed into multiple collections, including the University of Connecticut, the Slater Museum, the Institute for American Indian Studies, and the Yale Peabody Museum of Natural History, among others. Now, assessments of the site's antiquity tend to emphasize colonial contact, since there is dense evidence of commingled European and native objects during the 1630s. But archeological sorting methods, routine sorting methods, divvied everything up. So everything that was organic or um, considered to be indigenous was separated and identified as pre-contact or prehistoric. Everything that was English or metal or imported was separated and identified as historic or and that's an odd division because by the 1630s, the Mohegans were already deeply engaged in diplomatic and trade interactions with the Dutch, with the English and with others, particularly with the English. And so the material collections at Shantok reflect that intermingling and they reflect in very interesting ways. So for instance, in this box are organic materials, pieces of sandstone, shards of clay pots, deer bones, and broken quahog and whelk shells. In this box, which is a Shantok English material, at the bottom you see beef bones, you see bits of clay pipes, you see bits of metal, there's a jaw harp, there are a number of different objects here. But very interestingly, these are not just European objects. When we really think about what these things are being used for, these English pipes, for example, are not just trade objects, especially when they're being used for smoking native tobacco during diplomatic activity. Similarly, native clay pots could be used for cooking any number of things, native maize or English beef, depending on available provisions. And often in the Northeast in particular, native people would take other kinds of pots they would get from European sources through trade, copper and other metals and cut them up to use for other purposes. Archeologists have also found at Shantok a very distinctive pottery style with castellated rims incised with images of corn and other effigies. Now, unlike other Northeastern pottery, the Shantok pottery is not tempered with crushed oyster shell or stone, but with crushed whelk and coax shell debris from wampum making. So the glittery marks that you see in there are those bits of shell, specifically quahog and whelk. Now, the Yale collection is especially significant since it contains material that evidences all stages of wampum manufacture. And here we are back to wampum again, as I promised. Broken whelk and quahog shells, bead blanks, drilled beads, broken beads, sandstone used for polishing beads, and even iron nails such as this one shown here that have been forged and repurposed, heated up, the point drawn out, the, the head of the nail flattened, to use as drill bits, to literally jam into a native bow drill to use for making wampum. And so those weathered drill bits, just like the ones later recovered by the Mohegan Field School archeologists, fit very neatly into bits of drilled beads found at the same site in the precise location. Now, obviously this drill bit is not necessarily the one that drilled this particular bead, which you see broken, that's how it was found but you can see how these fit together and how these reflect 
the technology of wampum making, where these tiny beads are drilled from either end with these bits of metal. And so the nail does not represent, as one might imagine, or as some sources suggest, superior European technology. Instead, it's an expedient source of a raw material that's been retooled to serve indigenous purposes. And so with this in mind, it changes the way we think about Shantuck. It's not just a native site, it's not just an archeological dig, but it's really a place where materials were conceptually and materially altered to serve Mohican purposes. All of the activities conducted at Shantuck, shellfish harvesting, wampum making, feasting, pottery making, diplomacy, ceremonial activities, et cetera, et cetera. All of these reflect an integrated ceremonial complex deeply rooted in the Mohegan landscape. And so methodically, over the course of several decades, the Mohegan tribe's cultural and community program and archeological program staff have worked on calling these items back. But for years, Yale, which had the largest collection from Fort Shantuck, flatly refused to repatriate archeological material, saying it did not fit the NACRA categories of sacred or patrimonial. And they also refused to repatriate bowls and other objects, calling them utilitarian rather than patrimonial. And so one of the objects that they held back for a number of years was a wooden bowl embedded with wampum. And that is our case study number two. Now, in this case, you see a name attached to this bowl, Lucy Ockham Tanaquidgen, not because it was her personal bowl, but because she was the keeper of it. She was the tribal elder entrusted with holding on to this object, which was meant to be used communally. It has particular significance in the Mohegan Nation, having been in the custody of Lucy Ockham Tanaquidgen, who in the 18th century was a Mohegan matriarch and the great-great-grandmother of 20th century Mohegan traditionalist Fidelia Fielding. Burrow bowls like this were more than mere containers. They were ritually used for serving native foods like succotash, and they were passed down through the generations. And in this case, you know, the bowl includes white wampum beads. Now, having examined the wampum making materials from Fort Shantuck and the bowl and other wampum, I can tell you, even though you can see the inset photo is a little larger, that the beads are of the same quality, the same density, and the same era as the ones recovered archaeologically. But you can also see when you look at this bowl, that the beads are already drilled and there are traces of twine in the broken bead there. And this is a really interesting characteristic of wooden objects embedded with wampum beads. So far, all of the wooden objects I've seen embedded with beads, most of which are 17th to early 19th century, in every single case, the beads are already drilled. Now that would make no sense if they were just ornaments. I've had people say, oh, these are just ornamentation, but why would you take the effort of drilling a bead and putting fiber through it only to break it apart and then put it into a, a wool. What is really happening is that the beads are coming from woven wampum objects. So they are being repurposed out of what was once a collar or a belt and then placed into this object used for other ceremonial purposes. And I would argue that with that repurposing, these beads carry some memory of what they were originally meant to do. So if they are in a communal bowl, they are quite literally embedding a wooden object that is entrusted as a container for peace. If they end up in a war club, that's a very different story. That's basically taking what was once an object of peacemaking and turning it into an object of war. But the point here is also that this particular object brings together these two categories of richly significant objects. Burl bowls, meant to be used for communal feasting, and white wampum beads, making it a container for peace. Now, one of the reasons that Yale held back on repatriation is the argument was made that the bowl was simply utilitarian and that it was not associated with any individual and that it did not have any ceremonial significance. And yet, when I went through Yale's archives, I found this, uh, this is a portion of a letter from September 1913 where 
the notes are being taken by one of the Indian agents working with the Mohegan who is reporting to the director of the Yale Museum about significant objects held by the Mohegans. So when you look at the entire correspondence of which this is one piece, you find that the Indian age is reporting on genealogies, family relationships, who has what kind of material, whether it's being used in any kind of feasting context. And basically the Yale curators knew full well that this was a significant object when they endeavored to purchase it. And when they managed to purchase it from someone who was not entrusted to hold on to it. But the bowl is now home. Now, interestingly enough, this was a dramatically successful case because what had happened is that once all the documentation was put together, the Mohicans continued to press their case, not only with the university, but with the museum itself. And finally, in the fall of 2017, David Skelly at the Yale Peabody Museum initiated a conversation with Yale University concerning the potential of a museum to museum transfer without going through NAGPRA. And in a remarkable move, Yale agreed to return not only the burl bowl and the stump mortar used for grinding corn, but all of the archeological material from Fort Shantock. And in my understanding, this is one of the largest repatriations, more than 2000 objects in one fell swoop, all of which were acknowledged as Mohegan. And this is a really interesting case because rather than publish it, rather than go through a federal agency, the university and the tribe, the tribe said, we have a museum, you have a museum, we can curate our own objects. And in there was an enormous amount of publicity around this. It was a very successful case. And as Chief Lynn Malerba says, we, re, we celebrate the return of very significant sacred cultural objects to our people. And when the transfer was finalized, it not only followed years of discussions, but it also resolved years of argument over NAGPRA categories. The argument was just done once the objects came home. And as they are so gifted at doing, the Mohegan now have a new relationship with Yale and with the museum that is more collaborative and more forward thinking that includes redesigning the exhibits in the museum, includes more awareness of and recognition of Mohegan and Pequot culture in Connecticut includes a new understanding altogether. So it also tells us something else because now that most of the wampum material excavated from Fort Chantock has been repatriated, this particular tribal nation holds the densest material evidence of early colonial era wampum making on the continent. Wampum making on this scale was conducted not just to consolidate power or wealth in a single tribal nation, but to build relationships. So in this regard, Fort Shantok was not just a site of war or a fort, it was really a communication hub for the practice of indigenous diplomacy. And so Yale effectively recognized that as well by acknowledging that the Mohegan had never relinquished ownership of their objects or of their landscape. So these kinds of returns do more than merely respect indigenous sovereignty. They also enable better understandings of indigenous continuities that were ruptured by both archeological and museological intrusions. They reveal some of the actions that separated objects from communities and altered our representations of and our understandings of the indigenous past and by extension, our understandings of the indigenous future. And so I'd like to move on to the third case study, Fidelia Fielding's Diaries. Now, in this particular case, these papers came into being between about 1900 and 1904, when Mohegan elder Fidelia Ann Hoscott Smith Fielding, also called Jeets Bodernasha, began inscribing notes on Mohegan language, translations, weather observations, snippets of tradition, and comments on her everyday experiences in a series of small notebooks that we call diaries for lack of a better term. But what's interesting is that she utilized a unique orthography of the Mohegan language. 
By this point in time, most people no longer spoke the language, but Fidelia was quite fluent. She was also quite fluent in English. And so as an older woman, she befriended young Frank Speck, who was a Columbia graduate student when he first encountered the Mohegans. And so again, to make this case, Speck was not raised by the Mohegan, but he was in a sense tutored by Fidelia about language, about culture, and about traditions, tutored when he was already a student at Columbia. Now, Fidelia made the tactical error of loaning some of her papers to Speck, who loaned them to his professor, John Dinley Prince, who showed them off to their colleague, Franz Boas. But these Mohegan manuscripts, along with thousands of other manuscripts on early Algonquian languages, were lost forever when Prince's house burned to the ground. The surviving diaries that you see here were written into copies of Pierce's Memorandum and Account Book, a free book that was handed out at hardware stores and local stores. It was pre-printed with advertising, but Fidelia used it as a source of paper. And so really what's in the book originally has no relation to what she's writing in the book. But what she is writing is a number of her thoughts, including cases where she occasionally code switches into English to complain about her white neighbors or to tell particular stories or to warn people about how they should or should not behave. And having gone through Fidelia's surviving papers in great detail, I can tell you that there is only one reference to Frank Speck, and it says quite literally, Frank Speck visited me today. And that's about it. And she kept these journals and kept writing until she passed away in 1908. And in 1918, 10 years after her death, her adopted son gave the remaining papers to Frank Speck, along with a stack of other papers that included historical data, migration stories, geographical names, and maps. But then Fidelity Fielding's surviving papers disappeared from sight for decades. The tribal nation had no idea where they had gone. They were not archived in any of the Speck archives. They just disappeared. And what actually happened is that Speck had apparently left them at the High Museum. And at the High Museum, they were lost in storage. And in 1930, the entire High Museum, Museum of the American Indian Library, was folded into the collections of the Huntington Free Library shown here. And the Fidelia Diaries remained hidden within the Huntington collection for nearly eight decades. They almost surfaced once when the new National Museum of the American Indian opened in DC under the control of the Smithsonian. But at that point in time, Huntington refused to sell the collection. They were holding out for a higher bidder. And so in 2004, when the entire native collection of the Huntington Free Library was acquired to Cornell University and relocated to the Kroc Library on campus in Ithaca, that is the point at which Fidelia's diaries were rediscovered. And Cornell took an interesting tack. Instead of reaching out to the tribal nation to say, by the way, we have some papers belonging to one of your elders, they decide to publish the papers and to make them available to the world as part of their Vanished Worlds Enduring People project. And I, I say this in a wry sort of way because there was no effort in this particular project to include Mohegan perspectives, but Fidelia's papers were treated as though they were relics, rare survivors of a supposedly dead language, which is not the way the Mohegan nation thought about them. And so some diplomatic encounters ensued and some negotiations ensued. And finally, in November of 2020, the diaries were formally returned to the Mohegan nation and again, without going through NAGPRA, because under NAGPRA, an old woman's diaries are not considered sacred or patrimonial, although they are to the tribal nation. Now that repatriation by Cornell was somewhat unique, and I think it was a hopefully representative case, because the college admitted that they had accidentally, rather than intentionally, acquired Fidelia Fielding's diaries as part of a larger purpose without actually understanding either the context of their loss or the significance of the documentation within. 
And so after consultation, Cornell agreed to return these papers to their rightful home. Mohegan Chief Lynn Malerba praised Cornell's willingness to facilitate the repatriation, noting the process should be voluntarily un undertaken as justice in action. It is well past time for museums to rethink their relationship to objects of cultural patrimony and to ensure that communities who are the rightful heirs have a return of their ancestors. So Mohegan Tribal Historic Preservation Officer James Quinn, shown here, traveled to Ithaca to accept the return from Gerald Beasley, the Kroc University Librarian, and others in the Division of Rare and Manuscript Collections. And interestingly, the Mohegan Nation generously agreed to allow Cornell to retain the digital surrogates for research purposes. And that was another unusual thing about this. Many museums such as APS and others are increasingly engaged in what they call digital repatriation, by which they mean giving electronic or digital copies of documents to tribal nations. But in this case, the Mohegans really wanted the papers themselves. They didn't want just copies. And they could have withheld sharing the digital surrogates, but they allowed Cornell to keep them. And so by really thinking about this, by really considering repatriation as a relational rather than a litigious pro process, by finding ways to collaborate and cooperate in an appropriate return rather than argue about categories, this became a generous gift of an ethical return rather than a mediated response to a legal claim. And I suggest that other museums and archives could learn from this gift. They could be encouraged to treat indigenous nations with the same level of care that would be applied to relatives who are bringing home elderly kin, whether living or dead. Because in this case, it seems obvious that Fidelia Fielding was quite literally thinking into the future. She was sending living messages forward in time in her own handwriting, knowing that her unique orthography could be used to help reanimate a danger, the danger of losing the language, to help reanimate something that was in danger of being lost forever. And now that her original papers, the touch of her hands, and her hopes for the future are safely back at Mohegan, that is exactly what these documents are doing. They are forming the foundation of critical language recovery efforts that have been going on for quite some time. And so to return to my opening question, how can research on repatriation claims be negotiated as a restorative rather than a litigious process? Mohegan medicine woman, Melissa Tanaquid and Zobel suggests that the operative question should be, who is most in need of reconnection with the knowledges and memories embedded in this material. And here is where I emphasize the social relations of restorative research, because I have found in doing this work that collaborative inquiry is always more productive than argument. Even the best scholarly arguments degrade the opportunity to collaborate. And if we recognize and re-examine these idiosyncratic practices of historical collecting, we can understand that some things have accidentally landed in collections, are not intended for museums, were never meant to be publicly seen. And so to come back, I keep using this word interrogate, we need to investigate, interrogate, and decolonize not only the objects and archives and museums, but the conversations themselves. Because if we understand that scholarly theories do not necessarily emerge from indigenous knowledges, but they often are given a great deal of power over indigenous objects. And so I enlist literally everyone I meet as scouts in this process. It's remarkable how many people have notified me about lost objects, lost wampum belts, in many cases, objects in private collections rather than museums. So if we reframe these relations and these representations, then we can really start talking about preservation and recovery. And so, I consider restorative research as rather like the stages in a condolence ceremony. By looking at how we know, what we know, why we know, we can critically evaluate what we should know and what these received knowledges really, knowledge really mean. And if we think about this through the model of condolence, 
healthy relations can only come about after the competing parties step out of the darkness that drove them apart. Because the steps of condolence are that first, you recognize that you are in the forest. Then you find a way through the thorny bushes. And once you have done that, then you can start talking about negotiating peace. But you need to open your ears, clear your eyes, clear your throat, and speak honestly and truthfully and carefully. And so if we can do that, maybe together we can find a safe space to share a bowl of succotash and focus on recovering knowledges that will help rather than harm. Thank you. Let's see some more of those emojis for Marge. Thank you. Oh, thank so much, you. Dr. Bruchak. Yay. Um, you're welcome to take your SharePoint down there so we can see your face. Okay. And let Let's people do that. Give you a pause. That that was an amazing presentation, Marge, and was such thank a you. different perspective about NAGPRA and what can happen with repatriation relationships. I want to invite everyone to please use the Q&A um, with your questions, or you can also raise your hand. And what that will do is allow you to share your audio and video so that you can actually have a discussion with, with um, Dr. Brusak here about her presentation. So please I invite you all to ask questions about this. So, so going back to the wampum belt mm -hmm. repatriation. So that started in 2009. 2009, yeah. And the repatriation occurred? 2018. In 2018. And um, after all the efforts and the research that was done, uh, can you tell a little bit about the story of, of how that repatriation actually took place? I can. And actually, so I have an article called Broken Chains of Custody that was published by the American Philosophical Society in 2018. And it goes into great, great detail about all the steps. But what was particularly interesting about that is that that list I made of strategic alienation, steps in strategic alienation, each one of those was applied to those belts at some point in time, including misidentification. So part of how we came across the other Ganestage wampum belt is that it had been returned to Onondaga. And Onondaga made a point of sending it across the border to Ganestage because the two Mohawk wampum belts, I'll come back around to the Abenaki one in a moment, but the two Mohawk wampum belts were made in the early 1700s there was a five diamond belt made before the Tuscarora joined the Confederacy. Then a six diamond belt was made. So first to represent the five nations and the six nations. Both of those belts were sent to Ganesatage in again in the early 1700s to remind them that even though they were part of a mission village and they were living with the Sulpicians, that they were still part of the Confederacy. And so that's part of why those belts were so important to Ganesatage which is often seen as a mission community and not necessarily histor historians argue about whether it's part of the Confederacy, but there was no argument within the Confederacy itself. So when it was realized that the other half of that pair of belts was still at Onondaga, it was sent home. And I like to say that it then called the other one home mm -hmm. because the Sotheby's case wrapped up only after the private collector gave up. But there was no way, as you remember, no way legally to pressure the private collector, no way legally to pressure Sotheby's because it was now in private hands. We could not use NAGPRA. So all of the strategies we tried to get at home did not work until the, the collector finally just said, here, take them. And at that point, he handed over the Abenaki belt as well. And then Chief Curtis Nelson, who had brought home the two Mohawk belts, carried the Abenaki belt across the border to Canada to give to Chief Rick of Omswin at Odenak. And that resolved the Sotheby's case, but it's a very long story. Yeah, so. it really is. And you know, there were some, some 
a potential legal argument there, but we mm -hmm. weren't able to argue about those. There were some state, New York state um, uh, legal claims that could have been made for theft, but we didn't proceed with those. So I want to make sure everyone's clear. It's not that there weren't any other legal claims outside of NAGPRA. It's just mm -hmm. that we, uh, the nations felt it was better to try to negotiate for the return home rather than litigate for the return exactly. home. Yeah. And yeah. I noticed it in the chat, um, Irene Villasenor at the Met just put up the link for the Broken Chains article because I made a point of ensuring that that article would be publicly visible rather than locked behind some journal's firewall. And so APS agreed to make it open source so it's easy to find. Oh, and here she's gone to the pen repository, so it's there as well. That's great. Okay, I think we might have a question here. I'm going to bring Go for it. forward. Are museums and universities more receptive um, to repatriating to places that already have specific safeguarding facilities in place for the items? In other words, does the lack of a care facility frequently delay repatriation? That is definitely an argument that is often made. So for instance, the Mohegan, they have the Tanaquidja Museum, but it was not a quote unquote state of the art facility. But a few years ago, they did build a, a collection center that is climate controlled, et cetera. And so once the Mohican had the collection center, in addition to the Tanaquidja Museum, which I should say is the oldest tribally run Native American museum in the country, they've just celebrated their, I think their 90th some odd anniversary. But as soon as they built the collection center, any argument Yale tried to make about not having an appropriate repository was just specious. And the Mohegans also made the strategic move to collect Fort Chantock material from all of the other smaller institutions first, so that they not only had their own collection because they run a field school every year, they do an archeological field school, but they got the wampum from Chantock from the Slater Museum and the archeological material from the um, Institute for American Indian Studies and from several other institutions so that Yale was the one standout. And that's also why another piece of that argument, by the way, that's a really great question because yes, museums will use that argument to say you do not have a safe repository. But another piece of that argument that's important to understand is that objects are not necessarily meant to live forever. So there are cases where items need to go home to carry out the next stage of their life. So for instance, when I was in BC uh, about a year and a half ago at the, um, at the museum at the University of British Columbia, there were totem poles that had been repatriated that were quite literally lying in the woods, falling to pieces, because that is what the tribal nation wanted to do with them. And so I think, again, it's not, it's not really up to the curators to decide what happens when things go home it's up to the curators to ensure that things do go home. I mean, that's my perspective, just to kind of put, not put too fine a point on it. Yeah, no, but for sure, it's the, the museum under NAGPRA cannot dictate what happens after the repatriation. Once they've affiliated and they've done their mm -hmm. legal duties under NAGPRA to publish in the federal register, uh, their notice of intent to repatriate, um, they cannot dictate what the tribe does with the repatriation, right? So a lot of these yeah. um, inquiries from institutions, like how do we know you're going to take care of these items are just what I would call whack. That's a legal term of art, whack. <laughs> um, or, or they can just use it as an excuse to not repatriate. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, because they have so much power under NAGPRA. But I also mm -hmm. want to, you know, talk a little bit more uh, about this restorative idea of, of repatriation, because, you know, the practice of NAGPRA, I often say, is different than what the actual act yeah. um, is. So institutions have been given a lot of flexibility on how they interpret NAGPRA and haven't been mm -hmm. held 
to really the legal standard that's required because the enforcement and compliance mechanisms aren't, aren't all that great in NAGPRA. Right. So the restorative concept of repatriation is extremely, wow, it's, it's really advantageous and very creative. But on the other hand, I can see how institutions would try to work outside of NAGPRA um, uh, for, for many other reasons um, that uh, are of their own interests. Um, and I'm wondering within your work, what are some of the tactics that institutions use to keep from uh, repatriating items that they should that they should be required to repatriate under NAGPRA? I've laid out some of them. And I think some of the others that get used frequently are, and, and it sounds ironic because this is so simple, a lack of documentation. So I'll, I'll, give, I'll give you an example. So at the Penn Museum, there is a great deal of activity right now focused on repatriating the Morton Collection. So this is the Samuel Morton collection, which includes not only the crania that Morton collected in the mid 1800s, but others that were added to that collection later on. The Penn Museum inherited the entire Morton collection. In 20, I think it was 2016, 17, the museum created a special room to house the collection, including oak cabinets built to look like antique cabinets, and then turned it into a classroom so that the argument the museum uses is that these are important crania for scientific study that should be more available. The problem, of course, is that they are crania that were never meant to be part of a collection. They were, it is completely inappropriate to put them in ordinary classrooms. So students who were taking other classes sometimes ended up in that room thinking, why am I surrounded by skulls? And it, it, was, it was a horrifying situation, but the museum until quite recently made a very strong argument that the scientific value of the Morton collection was the most important thing and, and, and validated hanging on to them. But now that they have started actively repatriating and they've been doing this for a few years now, they are actively repatriating the ones that are relatively easy to document but they have a number that are difficult to document. So to my way of thinking, that difficulty can be resolved by provenance research, by research in Morton's correspondence. And so one of my graduate students, Paul, Paul Wolf Mitchell, is doing exactly that right now. Mm -hmm. He is meticulously going through all of Morton's correspondence and identifying where these individuals were collected who were the agents that were supplying skulls to Morton? What were the circumstances of those? And so that kind of research also unearths some of the, um, I don't have the right word for it, but some of the really egregious damage done by anthropological collecting. Things like collecting from battlefields, collecting from sites of massacres, collecting individuals, I mean, here's, here's a terrible case. It's not indigenous, but it's really a horrific case where black African-American people who left a condition of slavery to come North to seek freedom in the 19th century died in the almshouse in Philadelphia. And if they were poor, they were buried in the almshouse burying ground and Morton and others were excavating the burying ground to get skulls for study. So the degree to which that kind of collecting was perpetrated not just on Native American people, but on African American people, on poor people, on you know people who, who could not control the use of their body after death, and the continued use of collections like that for scientific study. I think just perpetuates the damage. And I know that's a very long-winded answer to what was a simple question. But I think that many of the arguments that museums use to hold on to collections could be turned in reverse as logical arguments to return collections. So if the science that's being conducted with human remains is increasing conditions of inequity and inhumane treatment 
of the descendants of those people that science is not valid and is not appropriate. And I think we really need to start calling out the damage being done by some of the destructive research that goes on in the name of science. Right. And and under NAGPRA, you make a determination based on the information you have, not on the right. information that you might have. Exactly. Um, we've got a um, Judy Shapiro joining us on the stage. Welcome, Judy. What question would you like to ask? Hi, first of all, I want to say thank you so very much. Um, my jaw, I'm still trying to get it back up from where it dropped. <laughs> um, I should say that, that some decades ago, I worked with the Mohegan tribe mm -hmm. and I worked with them on the federal acknowledgement process. And some of the, some of the riches that you have discussed had they been available during that time. Right. Because mm -hmm. at the, you know, I worked with Melissa Tantequich and Zoe Bell, who was on the tribal historian mm -hmm. and her, and Gladys was still around during that time, mm -hmm. which was pretty astounding. But at, you know, at that time, the, the, the story was that they couldn't be recognized because they'd run out of the line of, of important chiefs. And it wasn't until the focus had been shifted to women's leadership Mm -hmm. that things move forward. Now, if we had had access to those diaries, if we had access yeah. to the to the bowl and to the information about the bowl and the custody, the, the custody of it and the importance of, of it handed down in generations, that would have been a much easier argument to yes. make and sustain. And so when you're talking about a continuing harm it, it happens on so many levels. I mean, I'm, I, I love how much is coming home. And I am I am proud also to have been part of essentially the repatriation of Fort Chantock itself. Mm -hmm. Because we negotiated yeah. that with the state of Connecticut at, at the time of recognition as a time of severing some of the, the prior relationship with the state. We said, well, you know, we, we really want that back. Mm -hmm. And we sat in a room and said, what will it take to convince the state? And at that time it was money to just give it back. And that was one of the rock bottom parts of that negotiation following federal acknowledgement to get the state to back away and just let the tribe go and do it, what it was going to do. So yeah. in, the, in, in terms of what's cultural patrimony, to allow a museum to say what is and what is not is, I think, a total violation of NAGPRA and total violation of what is the tribes is the tribes and the decisions are not the, not the museums to make. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, we've been discussing this at some extent, but um, there's a whole reorientation that has to be done to take the power away from the museums because I don't think it, the museums have that power under federal law. They have just taken it. Right. And as a lawyer, my response is take it back. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's not a question, um, but just thank you so very much. Oh, you're very welcome. And thank you for adding that. That's That's so, so important is that in many cases, these objects that are missing or have been rediscovered or are being claimed are crucial to tribal survival and identity. And they often they often validate oral traditions that are not otherwise well recorded. That and the fact that non-federal tribes are frequently denied access to these collections and this repatriation yeah. is yet another harm of colonization. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Sorry. I'll back off now. Thank you. Thank you. Where's my mute button? There it is. Um, one question that I always love to, to talk with you about, um, Marge, is your work on Savage Kin, your, your book. And um, uh, I remember it was a little upsetting to me when you started revealing the lives of these anthropologists and archaeologists and what their intent seemed, or what seemed to show as their intent in their relationships with Indian tribes and Indian people and, and how they were collecting items. 
Um, can you talk a little bit about, about those relationships that you discovered? I can. And actually, I'll start with Frank Speck because that's the most obvious case. And it, I found it fascinating that virtually every archive that held Speck's papers promoted this fiction that he had been raised by Fidelia Fielding. And I have been through, as far as I know, all of the archives that hold Speck's papers, including the university archives that are not open to the public. And I've been through Gladys Tanaquidgen's archives, and I've interviewed Mohegan tribal members at length. And that story of him having been raised by the tribe took on a great deal of power, and it was used by his colleagues after his death to explain why tribal people trusted him. They said, oh, you know, it must be because he was raised by the Indians. Oh, his fluency with language must have come from that. But it really just came from he was a very dedicated and devoted researcher. And when I went into the university archives, I found that he often was criticized for literally dropping whatever he was doing anytime a native person came to his door. He, he would walk out on faculty meetings. He would walk out on conferences. Even when he was chair of the department, he much preferred spending time in the field or with native people. And as for the myth, I found that interestingly enough, his son, who was also named Frank Speck, Frank Stanisfield Speck, did indeed live with the Mohegans during the summers when Speck was off doing research in the field, often taking Gladys or Harold Tanaquidgen with him. So there was a Frank Speck who lived with the Mohegans, but it was not the anthropologist. So that sometimes I found that these, these relations of fictive kin had taken on different meanings at the time that were amplified by the way these people were looked at in the past. So for the Penn Museum to use that as an argument for holding on to a Mohegan object, in retrospect, at the time, you know, my book obviously hadn't come out, this research hadn't really been publicized, the tribal nation had been complaining about it, but it was hard to crack open the myth around that man's early life and to understand how that myth had also enabled the, the um, alienation of Mohegan property. So this is true in many, many cases where simply because an anthropologist got their hands on something does not mean they had a right to hold it or a right to buy and sell it or a right to pass it on to someone else. When Speck bought those wampum belts from Ganesatake, he actually bought four wampum belts that were in the hands of a Frenchman who had left Kanesatage and met up with Speck in Temiskaming and said, hey, I want to buy some wampum. And Speck is like, sure, he needed to fund his research. So I actually found the documentation that indicated that he had paid for his research trip in part by buying and selling sacred objects. And then when I found his notebooks, which are archived at the, um, at the Phillips Library, at the, at the Peabody Salem Museum, his notebooks are quite detailed, indicating where he was traveling, who was traveling with him, and what valuable purchases he had made. So at some point, I would hope to track all of those. It's an exhaustive project, but he, like many other people, were quite proud of their ability to acquire good stuff. And so there are stories, for instance, uh, Mark Raymond Harrington, would go to visit native communities and he'd seek out the elders and he'd get to know them. And he'd say, do you have anything in your attic that you'd like to part with? Or do you know anyone in your community who's hard up? Is there, is there someone that I could trade something with? And so sometimes things were gotten quite um, illegally, quite duplicitously. Sometimes things were acquired because people were literally starving. And the only thing they had of worth was something valuable they could sell to a collector. And so in researching the book, what I was looking for was the evidence of relationships and to try to understand how those relationships enabled the emergence of anthropology as a discipline, utilized indigenous knowledge, but also manipulated indigenous informants and indigenous communities to part with knowledges and objects for the anthropological project. So at the same time that it's an a history of anthropology. It's also an expose of bad relationships, for lack of a better term. Yeah, with, without a doubt, without a doubt. Yeah. Um, 
I want to invite you all to um, uh, put your questions in, uh, in our Q&A, and please feel free to raise your hands. Um, I have a I have another question. I'm not sure how much it connects with the, the Frank Speck story. Doesn't but, have to. But. <laughs> but could you talk a little bit more about On the Wampum Trail? And um, there are many of us who look up to Rick Hill and his activism and his art. Mm -hmm. um, and could you talk a little bit about that? I could. Um, I'm not sure if I can share the link to the Wampum Trail. Let me just see if that's possible here. If not, I can I can find it real quick. Okay, if you could find it and share it, that would be really helpful. Because we did put together, so the Wampum Trail project started quite literally with the Sotheby's case. And then at Rick's urging, the question was, how do we locate the other at least 400 wampum belts we know to be missing in museums? And so I started a deep survey of museum collections uh, also tribal collections. And at first, I naively thought I would be able to locate every wampum belt, identify the community of origin, and get them home. But it was at that point, early on in the project, I realized the degree of scattering. And so I started the Wampum Trail Project as a way to both conduct this research and also share some of the insights in the research. So what you see on the blog is only a portion of what we do but it's the material that we're able to share. And so for example, um, this is a lovely example. My student Lise Puyo is finishing up her dissertation, which is focused on wampum belts that were specifically made by Abenaki, Huron-Wendat, and in this particular case, the Algonquin community living at Ganastage, but made to send to Europe, to send to French repositories and these belts were made to speak to Catholic saints. So it's a case where indigenous nations were using indigenous knowledge, indigenous materials, combining it syncretically with this Catholic religion that came to them, and then creating objects that were intended to speak to the saints themselves, uh, sort of in the hands of the missionaries and the nuns and the priests. But the belts were made to act as agents and emissaries to ask for a more equitable relationship. So quite literally, these native people were saying, you want to deal with us? We are going to speak directly to the people above you who are the religious authorities who are guiding you and ask them to take us as allies and friends. Now, of course, that's not the message that was retained. So Lise is tracking how the belts were made, where they were made, where they were sent, whether they still survive and what that message might be. And so she was able to get into the Vatican, as I noted, she was also able to get into Chartres Cathedral to photograph the belts there. And just a few weeks ago, a delegation from Ganondagan, including Pete Jemison and Mike Galvin and others were in France with Jonathan Laney as well to go to these repositories to speak with these wampum belts. And that's what we hope the wampum trail does. We hope that we are able to open the door to make these collections more visible and then to encourage these housing institutions to invite the people who need to speak with these objects to then come there. That's Shannon, it. did you manage to find the link yet? Um, yes, I put it in the uh, chat on Thank the Walking Trail is, is there. Excellent. That's just incredible. I, I'll never forget the time. Uh, were you with us when we were in Sotheby's visiting the belts? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. I mean, that I, I will never forget that trip in that time mm -hmm. um, with uh, with Curtis Nelson as he yeah. um, held the belt and spoke to the belt. Um, we and, were all crying. I'm surprised and, we can remember any of it. Yeah, 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 it was it was incredible. And 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 his plea to the individuals at Sotheby's that, you know, you've, you've put, you know, this, like a child, this is like a child in a drawer without food, without air, without nourishment. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the sadness and grief um, felt by mm -hmm. that, um, uh, uh, the group of, of people from 
from the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, it was it was just it was so palpable, and and I know it affected Sotheby's, but yet um, uh, they didn't move very far. No, no. Yeah, the only move they made was to withdraw them from the auction and return them to the owner. That was it. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I and I actually have an undergraduate student working with me right now who is tracking the early Sotheby's and Christie's auctions and also tracking American Indian Art Magazine to see what kinds of objects are being offered for sale in the 1970s and 80s and 90s and what values are being attached to them. Because the other thing I haven't mentioned is that knowing that two of those wampum belts had been in the collections of the Museum of the American Indian also led me to Edmund Carpenter's work when he was a trustee, when the museum was forced to close because of the sales that were going on by Edward Dockstader, who was the director at the time. And Carpenter, before he passed away, um, estimated that at least 80,000 objects had left MAI under Dockstader's tenure. And I think most of those objects are still circulating on the American Indian art market. And every time they resurface, their value goes up. And so ironically, creating the market in American Indian art is what enabled the wider circulation of indigenous cultural patrimony and sacred objects outside of museums. And, and it, it continues to increase their value. So I appreciate the work that you're doing with AAIA on tracking these auctions and calling attention to them because that was not done until you really initiated it. And it's something that most people are not aware of. You know, who decides what is art and what is sacred and which category? And my argument is that it's almost never indigenous people who make those decisions, but it's whoever happens to have their hands on the object and have it in their possession. And even to get back to NAGPRA, and I don't mean to say that NAGPRA is completely flawed because it's obviously accomplished amazing things, but NAGPRA is all about possession. So an institution is only required to report on what they physically possess or tangibly control. So even MAI, and, and you remember this call, we contacted NMAI and said, can you please help with this? These were once part of your collection. And the answer was no. If they're not here, we can't help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you got it. So, so what, um, I know you're not a lawyer, Mart, <laughs> Um, but if there is, if there was something that we could do with NAGPRA to make it, uh, make it better, mm -hmm. what do you think that would be? I think not just, I was going to say force, but that's a bad word. I was going to say encourage, require collaboration to actually require institutions with related collections to collaborate, to share information with one another. So for example, if, um, if a tribal nation puts forth a claim on an object that is similar to an object in another museum, I think it should be the it should be the responsibility of these museums to report together, to collaborate together, to to reach, you know, it shouldn't, so so tribal nations shouldn't have to have armies of people looking for their, their patrimony. There should be armies of people inside the institutions reaching out. I'll, gi I'll give you a great example. The photo I, I used of Laura Pierce and I at the Pitt Rivers Museum, even though we didn't find the belts we were looking for, what was lovely about that visit is that Arts Council England funded a visit so that we could go through every institution in England that had wampum in their collections on behalf of the Aquina Wampanoag and Mashpee Wampanoag while on the search for King Philip's wampum that disappeared in 1676. It's a long story. It was sent to England and it disappeared somewhere along the way. And we all suspect it's still somewhere in Europe. We don't know where. But the fact that institutions put up the money to fund and encourage the research, and then Pitt Rivers and the British Museum and Arts Council England also put up the money to fund the Wampanoag nations in creating a new wampum belt that they will retain hold of, but it has been on exhibit in England as part of the Plymouth 400 and Plymouth 2020. And so 
again, I, I also think these institutions that have benefited for so many years from holding and displaying indigenous objects should have to give something back, something more than just objects, something more than just a repatriation claim. They should be supporting cultural restoration. They should be supporting language recovery. They should be funding indigenous scholars because I came back to academia late in life when I realized this work was necessary and one had to be inside the institutions to get some of this work done. So quite literally, I altered my entire career to become an anthropologist so I could figure out how to solve some of these problems. Yes, you did. Uh, we have a couple. And you witnessed it, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah. Let me bring in a, a couple of questions. Uh, Dr. Bruchak, uh -huh. have you ever encountered a situation where a tribe does not want items returned or repatriated? What do you do in those cases? So there are some Southwestern tribal nations who do not want human remains back. And, and it's their assessment that these, these ancestors are upset, they are disturbed, and they do not necessarily want to bring them home. And so in those cases, I still think the institutional responsibility has not ended. I think that there should be some alternative accommodation. Again, this is just my opinion. Um, I have not personally encountered cases like that. But my opinion is that if there is a situation that each, if the institution finds that the tribal nation does not want the return, they should ask, then what do you want? What can we do for you? What can we do in the interim? Do you want us to hold on? Do you want us to protect? Do you want us to, is there something else we can do for you? Because again, I think, I think you know, NAGPRA does not legislate reciprocity. And maybe that's the gist of the problem, that it's it's a litigious rather than a reciprocal medium. There is there is no actual means to encourage reciprocity, and I think we need more of that. Yeah, good 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 point. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. We have another question here um, from Teresa. You had briefly mentioned digital repatriation being used by museums as a substitute for repatriating the object being requested. How often is this done? Is the actual object eventually repatriated? So digital repatriation is relatively new. It's really only come about in the last decade or so. Um, APS, as I noted, the American Philosophical Society is at the forefront. And APS is actually still grappling with this as we speak because when they created their protocols, and this is another article, I should put a link in the chat somewhere, because there are, there are several articles where APS explains how they develop the protocols and what they're meant to do. So APS, in terms of reciprocity, agrees to maintain and protect culturally sensitive documents and images, but they do not agree to repatriate those. And so again, it's this sort of middle ground where the institution still holds the documents in question, acknowledges the tribal nation owns them, but does not return them. Again, that's why the Fidelity Fielding Diaries are such an interesting case. So um, circle back to the question for a second. This, this idea of who, I, I think the question is really about who has a right to hold and curate in perpetuity some document or image or object? And so I, I've seen in the last few years, digital repatriation increasingly being offered as a substitute. And it's usually offered when an institution is not willing to give the actual object back. So I don't know how often it's happening, but I can tell you it's increasing. And again, that's why I like using the Mohegan Diaries as a representative case, that maybe it's the wrong way. Maybe the institution should keep the digital surrogate, which if they have permission, they can replicate as much as they want, and the original could go back to the nation. Why not? Got a lot of applause for that one. I see that, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, and, and the bottom line is, is that um, the institution and the museums don't know what's possible. Yeah. Unless yeah. they talk to the tribes, unless they collaborate, unless they consult as what is required of them under law. Um, exactly. Uh, yeah. So, so uh, uh, Marge, I want to make sure we've got all our, our questions answered. And um, do you have any final words or anything that you want to, to leave us with here tonight or in the future or about what you're, what's coming up for you? Oh, there's so much. So I'm actually, um, I'm in the process of trying to find ways to write philosophically about these challenges. So I actually have two articles that will be coming out. Uh, let me just get the titles for these for you. One is in a volume called Invisible Labor, where I write about and talk about how we can see the people behind the objects and also how we can see the objects themselves as participating in their own construction. Because I've come to believe that, especially indigenous objects that are made to be meaningful, take on agency of their own and really carry memories of their own. And that's well understood by medicine people in tribal nations. It's not well understood by museums it's a, it's a big argument in anthropology, the ontology of objects. And there are some theorists who insist that objects cannot have agency in and of themselves. I, I disagree. So one of those articles is called Of Animacy and Afterlives, Material Memories in Indigenous Collections. And then the second is A Pragmatic Approach to Reconciliation, Thoughts on Transforming Repatriation Practice. So you've heard some of the thoughts in the second article in, in this particular talk, that'll be coming out in Pragmatism in the New Museum Anthropology, edited by Christina Hodge. And the first one, Animacy and Afterlives, is coming out in Invisible Labor, Knowledge Production in the Human Sciences, edited by Jenny Bangham. And so those will both be coming out in 2022. And I'm trying to find more ways to do that because there is, as I noted, there's a lot of practical knowledge and case histories in this strategy articles such as Broken Chains, but I want people to really sort of step back and think about these concerns and not in simply black and white terms. It's not just that there is one body of people who are committed to doing damage and then there are indigenous people who are committed to recovery. There are people all over the map and all through the discipline attempting to resolve these issues. And I think we are Again, that's why I like using condolence as a metaphor, because I think we are in a moment in time when we are all suddenly aware, and by all of us, I mean those of us who are in museums, in anthropology, in sociology, even in history, in these disciplines that meld museological and academic knowledges and that depend upon indigenous people and indigenous stories and objects and, and narratives. But all of us are recognizing that we have been in the darkness. We have been in the dark woods. We are caught in the thorny bushes. The thorny bushes are where we end up when we argue, when we fight, when we disagree, when we commit lateral violence against one another, when we tussle unnecessarily. And so if we turn to notions of condolence as ways of healing, we can say, let's just stop. Let's think, let's care. In fact, my student Stephanie Mock is using that analogy of care as a way to approach repatriation and decolonization. How do we use a model of care for ourselves, for our communities, for each other, and even for the people in these institutions, how do we use that as transformative, as not just argumentative, but to say, if we are all interested in these collections, what can we do that will be healing, that will be helpful? that will do what museums claimed to be doing. Museums claim to be curating the past for future generations. But if those practices of curation are causing harm in the present, that harm will resonate into the future unless we stop now and do something differently. And I do not have all the answers. I only have a few answers from my own experience and my own colleagues, but these are the, this is the way I'm thinking about this.
Thank you so much, uh, my friend, um, uh, Marge, Dr. Bruce Jack. Everything back. <laughs>